your attention, please. Thank you. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Uh, Vicki Scowcroft is a postdoctoral research associate at, at the Carnegie Observatories. Uh, her training includes a master's in astrophysics from the University of Leeds and a PhD uh, at the Astrophysics Research Institute at Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, her work is centered on the Carnegie Hubble, Hub, Hubble program. It's the, the, the most important name, uh, proper name in all of astronomy, and I just got it wrong. How is that? Okay. <laughs> the Carnegie Hubble program. Uh, with her specialty in calibrating the extragalactic distance scale uh, using Spitzer uh, Space Telescope data uh, on a particular uh, group of stars that we'll hear about today, the Cepheid variable stars. Uh, if uh, some of you are, are, are astronomy and, and uh, physics majors and in astronomy classes, you know that these are an essential uh, standard candle for understanding the distance uh, scales in the universe. Let's please welcome Dr. Vicki Scowcroft. Um, so, thank you for having me here today. Um, very, um, very grateful that you invited me here. Um, I was actually having a look at the list of the previous speakers the other day, and I'm quite intimidated now to see the, <laughs> the list of the people you've had, like um, several pe people from, from my institution, like um, Alan Sandage and Vera Rubin and other scary people. Um, well, Alan Sandage was scary, Vera Rubin is not scary. Um, but he's, he's, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about um, Cepheid variables, which we've been studying now for just over a century. Um, so basically, um, as astronomers, what we do is we take pretty pictures of the night sky. So this picture here is um, it's actually taken with a regular camera um, to, by Yuri Beletsky who's one of the astronomers down at the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile, which was run by Carnegie. Um, so this is Juna, and this is Drew. These are two astronomers from Carnegie. Um, this is the Milky Way, and this is one of the Magellan telescopes. Somebody took this with a camera. <laughs> so this is a pretty picture. My job as an astronomer is to take pretty pictures like this and to make precise measurements of stars rather than just say, that's pretty. And I use lots of different skills that I've developed dur during my training as a physicist and as an astronomer. So here we have a similar looking pretty picture of a nearby galaxy called M31. So this is one of our nearest neighbors. And you've probably seen it before. Um, so this is similar to what we saw of the Milky Way on the previous slide. Um, but this is actually a very special picture of M31. Um, so if we zoom in, um, it's going to stutter a little bit, but um, this is actually the highest resolution image ever taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so every single little dot here, this isn't like bad images or like pixelation. Every single dot here is a star. And the color, this isn't noise. This is the actual color of the star. This is, this is, this is information. This is data. This isn't just like mess. So there, this, this image is huge. This image was so big that when they showed it at the AAS last year in Seattle, it took up a wall that's probably even longer than this room when they printed it off. And the resolution was still amazing. So what we do as astronomers is we take the pictures and measure each of these tiny points of light and turn them into to information about the stars. So what we're doing is taking the information about the brightness of the star here and the color here and putting it on what we call a color magnitude diagram or an HR diagram. Um, so this is basically what I do all day. I look at pictures like that, measure the stars, put them on here. Um, so here we have like a few um, local stars labeled. Um, here is one of my favorite stars, Polaris. This is the North Star, and it's actually a Cepheid. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is the same diagram as on the previous slide, um, but now we're looking at an HR, uh, Herxbrung Russell diagram, sorry, an HR diagram. Um, 
Is that a question for me? No. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the same diagram as the previous slide, but now the only stars on this diagram are variable stars. So variable stars are stars where their brightness changes over time due to the actual star changing, rather than something about the environment. So um, here we have where the cephids live. The cephids live in a very specific region of the HR diagram. Now cephids are very young stars. Um, they, they haven't, they're not, they're what we call population one. So they've been, they, they were like the most recent population of stars that have formed. Um, they have masses a few times that of the sun, but they're a lot brighter than the sun. They're around 1,000 to 10,000 times brighter than the sun. And the, they, the way they pulsate is they pul pulsate radially. There are lots of different ways that stars can pulsate, and I won't go into that, but the cephids kind of just do this. They look, kind of blob around. And uh, they pulsate pretty slowly. What do they put? 10 to... Yeah, okay, one day, two, 200 days. Imagine that says two, not 10. Um, yeah, so the period of their pulsation is between about one and 200 days. They're actually also quite dangerous. Uh, I will tell you why. Um, so this is John Goodrick, and he discovered the first known cephid. So there was a star called Eta Aquilae, and he observed it every day in 1784. And he, he was living in Yorkshire, where I went to university, and he observed it every night. He was like, oh, this is changing, looking at it every day. Um, and then he started looking at um, Delta Cephei as well. And that's where the name Cephid comes from, it was from Delta Cephei. And so he was looking at these two stars every night. And he, he actually calculated the period of Delta Cephei, and he discovered it was 5.14 days, um, which is very consistent with what we found it is today. We today we measure it to be 5.37 days, um, which is very close to what we, we know it is. And it could have even been 5.14 days at the time that he measured it, because Cephid's periods actually change. Now the reason I say that it's Cephids were dangerous is that when John Goodrick was observing these stars every day. He was doing it in cold, rainy Yorkshire every night. And eventually he caught pneumonia and he died from cephids. So that is why I now observe with a space telescope from California. <laughs> so, yes. So that was how cephids were discovered. So, as I said, cephids pulsate radially. Um, the, the reason that this happens is that they have um, helium um, in their atmosphere and as the star increases in temperature, the helium is ionized, so the, the photons can knock off electrons. Um, and when this happens, the, the helium in the, in the atmosphere, when, when it's ionized, it changes the opacity of the star. So that means that the, the radiation can't escape. So if you've got a big ball of gas and the radiation can't escape from it, then the pressure inside that big ball of gas will increase. And if your pressure is increased and the, nothing can escape, then the star must become bigger. So you've got, it's become bigger like this. Now, what, what will happen to a big ball of gas if it expands, then it's gonna become cooler. This is just the ideal gas law. So as it expands, and it will become cooler, then what can happen is that the helium that was previously ionized, the electrons can come back and it can um, recombine. And when that happens, um, the radiation can escape again. So now we've got the radiation escaping, so the star can cool, and then as it cools, the star can then get smaller again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put myself out there because it's been a while since I thought about this mode, okay. right? But you're saying it becomes um, uh, more opaque and traps in because um, it's hot, it's small and hot. It, it then um, it then ionizes the the once ionized helium to twice ionized helium. Yeah. There are there two things that could therefore make it be more opaque? Mm 
-hmm. and that is the second ionized helium and the cross section of light interacting with that. Or it could be that, that it interacts with the electrons that you free. Now you've got sort of double the, the, the number of free electrons. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I follow that that means that, that it's opaque, it'll push out until a point where it recombines and now it's translucent again and collapses. Yeah. But is it mostly due to the extra electrons and sort of Thomson scattering or is it, or is it, the, is it the, 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 the helium nucleus? I think it's due to the electrons, but I haven't thought about this in a very long time. Okay, I feel better having not known the answer directly at <laughs> the top of my head. Okay, yeah, good. Um, I, let's go with electrons. Let's go with electrons. Okay. <laughs> so yes, recombination, radiation is escaping by some mechanism. Um, yes. So yeah, basically you've got the ideal gas law that is making the star get bigger and smaller. And because you can describe this as, as an ideal gas, and you, this is very predictable, um, you know we can we can explain this mathematically and it's basically the pulsation is traveling through the star like a sound wave. I'm not going to go into all the maths of this, but, the, but because we can explain this like a sound wave, it leads to the period luminosity relation. So that's the relationship between the brightness of the star, the, the intrinsic brightness of the star, and the rate that it pulsates. But it's, if, if you want to know more about that, I can show you where you can read the maths Trust me, it would make this talk very boring. Um, so this is um, Henrietta Leavitt. Um, and she was the first person to observe the period luminosity relation. So she was looking at stars in the small Magellanic cloud in 1912. See, century of seconds. Um, and she noticed, like, this is the minimum brightness of a star that she looked at, and these are the maximum brightnesses of the same stars. So she knew that these stars were varying. She didn't know why. She didn't know what they were. Um, and this is the log of the period. Um, and she noticed in this seminal paper in 1912 that the, the brighter variables have the longer periods. And then that became what we know today as the period luminosity relation. Now, in 2009, the International Astro Astronomical Union decided hang on a minute, if Henriette Levitt had been a man, we would not be calling this the period luminosity relation. <laughs> we would be calling it the Levitt law. <laughs> so there was actually a resolution passed at the, at the IAU in 2009 that we will now call this, rather than the period luminosity relation, the Levitt law. So if you come across in any more recent papers than that, the Levitt law, that's what it means. It means the period luminosity relation, and we, our, our group, has adopted that for all, all of our papers now, and more people are like catching on to that. So, this is actually um, some modern data of the same stars in the previous plot. So, go back. This is um, a sample of Cepheids in the SMC, and these are. This includes some of the same stars. In fact, like a lot of these are still designated with the same identifiers that Henrietta Leavitt discovered them with. And now we can see we're looking at different wavelengths all the way from U, V, R, I, J, H, K, and then the mid infrared. So these starting in the blue wavelengths down here through, the, through to the optical and then out to longer wavelengths. So these are exactly the same stars. We're still looking at the same stars 100 years later, but they're going to tell us new things. Um, so this is actually one of the most fundamental things that, that Cepheids have taught us. Um, you might recognize this image. Um, this was actually, um, this is a very famous plate taken by Edwin Hubble. Um, when he was uh, an astronomer at Carnegie. And this is an image of M31. And these points here, um, here, you won't be able to see them. And this is where he's saying, these are variable stars. Um, they're actually the first discovery of variable stars in M31. 
And the reason that this was important was that until this point, nobody really knew that there were galaxies outside of the Milky Way. We, everyone thought that was it. We, we were it. And they didn't know that this was another galaxy. They thought it was just like a, a cloud or something. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so they, he worked using the Levitt law, he worked out that the distance of these um, Cephids in this galaxy and in a couple of other Cephids in a couple of other galaxies must mean that they were outside the Milky Way. So if we look at this, this was um, NGC 6822, another galaxy he was looking at the same time. Um, he measured the distances to the Cephids and he said, this is the first object definitely assigned to a region outside the galactic system. So this is the first discovery of a galaxy outside our own, entirely attributable to Cephids and the Levitt law. So this is the distance modulus that he measured um, in 1925 to NGC 6822. And this is the distance modulus that my group measured last year. Again, we're still doing the same thing 100 years later. Um, but yeah, um, we can't directly compare these numbers right now because it was a completely different calibration. The, um, the period luminosity relation calibration was not very well known at this point. And obviously, this was the first discovery of a galaxy. But it's very interesting that this was, um, that this happened. Another thing I learned last night on Facebook, <laughs> this is relevant. Um, Hubble might not have actually been the first person to discover Cephids in M31. So apparently, there was an astronomer called Humerson, who was also at Carnegie, and an astronomer called Shapley, who was also at Carnegie, and Humerson was looking through one of the plates of M31, and he thought he found Cephids, and he labeled them and gave it to Shapley, and Shapley was like, no, they're not Cephids, and rubbed all the markings off, completely denied that they were there, and then it never followed up. And like this was a couple of years before Hubble discovered them. So yeah, Humerson like went to his grave saying that this happened, and then Shapley denied it because he didn't want to look stupid, but Sandage claimed it happened. And this is what I found out on Facebook last night. So <laughs> Facebook astronomers group is very interesting. <laughs> okay. So this is another bit by Hubble. Um, this was what we all know and love him for, is the expansion of the universe. So once he discovered that there were in fact other galaxies out there, um, he, that we can measure their distances and their um, velocity moving away from us, and you can relate their distance to their velocity and make a Hubble diagram. It's nice to name things after yourself. Um, but, so this is the relationship between the velocity and the distance. And that will tell you how fast the universe is expanding. So this is the first confirmation that the universe is expanding. Um, so this is what we call the measurement of the Hubble constant, or h, h naught. So Hubble's first measurement um, in, at Mount Wilson was around here. And as you can see, he was quite high. Not as high as this guy. But over the years, we have, we do seem to have converged on an answer. But not as well as you'd think. There was a lot of, there's still, this is just the last like 10 years. There is still some, a fair amount of scatter. And we now reach the point where the error bars on these measurements of the Hubble constant are so small that we're not really agreeing with each other anymore. Um, I, think, I think that was our groups. No, that, one of these is ours. Anyway, um, but the problem is we have all these different techniques of measuring the Hubble constant now, and we're getting to the point where one of them is probably right, but we don't know which one. Um, our error bars are very small. So, as I said, we've been doing the same thing with Cephids for a long time now, so surely we, mis we must be done, right? Um, have we solved all the problems? Well, here's just an example of two more problems. Um, this one originated in 1979. Um, so this is period, and this is the ratio of the mass that you would derive 
if you made a theoretical model of a Cepheid and like let the star evolve and made a model and you derived the mass of that Cepheid. And the mass of the Cepheid you would derive if you made um, the pulsational mass of the Cepheid. So if you made a model of like the pulsating ball of gas. And you should get the same answer, whichever one you do. You don't, you don't get the same answer. And we have not been getting the same answer since, since they first tried to do it in 1979. So we haven't fixed that problem. Another problem is that we can't decide if the, comp the, the amount of metals in the star, like the amount of um, iron or oxygen or anything, ba basically anything heavier than helium, has an effect on the brightness of a Cepheid. And that could be a problem because if you're in a different galaxy, then the composition of those stars is going to be different. It's not even that we can't decide. Theory tells us that it should go in one direction, and observations tell us it's going in a different direction. So this is a paper from 2008 giving, this, so this quantity here measures how much the brightness of the star is going to depend on metallicity. And these are all values in the, like between 2000 one, well, no, but in, in the 90s and 2000s. Still don't agree. I think my thesis value was here. So at least I was kind of in the middle. But yeah, that's just another problem we haven't solved. And the Hubble constant is even worse. So this was a quote by a guy called Wayne Hu, who's like awesome at measuring the, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. And he says, the Hubble constant has always been known to 10%. So the error bar has always been 10%, despite the fact that it's changed by a factor of 10. So it used to be 600. Now it's like 70-something. But we've always known it to 10%. No. We're, we're, we're not done. OK. So why do we want to study Cepheids now? Why do we want to continue? So the reason we want to do it now is that now we're in the era of precision astronomy. So we have these wonderful telescopes now that mean we can do things that we could never do before. So this is what, the one I work with mainly, which is Spitzer, which is an infrared telescope. We also have Kepler, which you've probably heard about for looking at exoplanets, and that does very, very precise photometry. And Gaia, which just launched very recently, and we haven't really got a lot of results from yet, but that's going to be able to measure the distances to stars very, very precisely. So this is what I do. I, I study populations of Cepheids using mid-infrared wavelengths with Spitzer. So I look at, rather than just individual stars, I look at a whole population. So I look at all the stars in one galaxy or all the stars in another galaxy and look at them as a population. So the first question you might want to know is, why do I look in the mid-infrared? So the first reason is that the mid-infrared practically gets rid of reddening and extinction. So if you don't know what reddening and extinction are, so basically the universe is filled with dust. Like, there is dust everywhere. And if there is dust in between you and an object, it's going to look red. It's going to look more red than it really is. And it's going to look fainter than it really is. But if you look at, if you use the mid infrared to look at that object, the wavelength of that light is such that the effects of that reddening are basically gone. So this is normalized, so this is basically visible light. So if you looked at shorter wavelengths, all the all the light would basically be scattered. And you're gonna, it's going to look much fainter and much redder. But as you move down to redder wavelengths, the effect drops off dramatically. So it's going to get closer and closer to the true value of the, of the color and of the brightness. You, um, second reason is that, as I showed you this plot before, of the Cepheids in the SMC, the Small Magellanic Cloud, here is the, the the Levitt law in the blue, and here's the Levitt law in the infrared. 
and you can see these these ones have a lot of scatter so they have a lot of range around the mean whereas here where I'm looking they're much they're much thinner they're much more well defined so if I took any point on this I would be much closer to the mean so it's much easier to get a good measurement of the distance to a population with fewer stars than it would be if I just took a random point from here. So the infrared helps me there. And it's a similar, um, similar thing when you look at the light curve of an individual star. Again, here are the blue wavelengths, here are the infrared. And now, because of the way the star works, when I'm looking at a blue wavelength, it's coming from a different part of the star to when I look at a, a red wavelength. Basically, when I'm looking at the red wavelengths, this is just has a really small amplitude. So if I just took a point here, I'm going to be very close to the mean, um, the mean magnitude of the star. If I took a point here, and I didn't know where it was on the light curve, so that was my only observation I had, I could be really far off the mean value. But here, even if I was at the brightest point, I'm still going to be pretty close. So basically, the infrared is the best. Um, so this is my baby, um, Spitzer. Um, so Spitzer launched uh, in August 2003, and it had a five and a half year cryogenic mission. And it has a camera set up like this. So there's one field here and one field here. It takes a picture and then it shifts. Um, so then it puts the field that was here there and this one there. So it's always taking two pictures at the same time. After the cryogenic mission ran out, we got warm Spitzer. So when all the liquid helium ran out of Spitzer, um, the, cameras basically, the cameras heated up and you couldn't use the long wavelengths for observing anymore. So we were just left with 3.6 microns and 4.5 microns. So we couldn't do anything with the long wavelengths. But for people like me, that's fine. We only really want 3.6 and 4.5. So we were good. Um, so that's our, our, all of our work has been done with the warm mission. So this is an example of the data we get from Spitzer. So these are six cephids in the Milky Way. Um, this is the light curve at 3.6 microns. This is the one at 4.5 microns, just offset a little bit. So you can see that there are two there. And then this is the difference between them. So you can actually see that the color of the star is changing as well throughout the cycle. So this was actually very unexpected. We were expecting it to be completely flat. And for a long time, we thought we'd done something wrong. Um, we had to, we redid everything. We spent months trying to make sure the calibration was right or that we hadn't like just messed something up in the code or we just, yeah, we just presumed everything was wrong, but it wasn't. And this is actually a very interesting result. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today, I don't have time, but this is cool. You can discover things even when you didn't expect to. Um, so the first thing we had to do is calibrate um, the Levitt law. So we use several stars in the galaxy where we have a dist distance known from a different source. So these stars all have distances measured using parallax. So if you like shut one eye and then shut the other eye, you see that everything moves. We basically do that with these stars, but with the Hubble Space Telescope and use the sensors on that to measure a very accurate distance to these ones. Um, so that means rather than just putting, looking at their absolute, <coughs> at their apparent magnitude, we can put them on an absolute magnitude scale. And this allows us to calibrate the, the, the absolute magnitude of the Levitt law. So the first thing we did after we had the calibration is get the distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud. So this was from a press release from the Spitzer Science Center on our work. So the yellow points are cephids in the Milky Way, and the blue points are cephids in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this is the distance we measured to the cloud. 
And this, at the time, was the most precise measurement of the, the distance of Magellanic Cloud. Because, all because, basically, this has very small scatter around it, and the, and the zero point that we determined on the previous slide is very well known because of the small amplitude and the small dispersion, and because we use parallax measurements to calibrate. So we're very proud of this. Some of our students might be more familiar with light years. Could you describe how far away the large Magellanic Cloud, I mean, if we would just take it's three times, it's 3.26 times this, right? So yeah. I'm just gonna say out loud to enter in the record that it's <laughs> slightly more than 150,000 light years away yeah. for, for, for people who care to know the size scale of these, these satellites to our own galaxy. Okay. Okay, I, I, no, that's good because now I know the condition. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's 3.26. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so this is a nice, simple galaxy to look at. This is the Large Mag Magellanic Cloud is quite simple because all the stars are basically at the same distance from us. So the next galaxy we looked at um, is the Small Magellanic Cloud. So this is another time you've seen this plot. Um, what you, what you probably can't see on here is that the, the scatter around these lines is slightly increased from the previous, uh, from the LMC. Um, so in the LMC, in the, in the large Magellanic Cloud, this value is 0 0.10. And here it's 0 0.16. So that's actually significantly bigger. And what we thought that might be is because of the depth of the, of the small Magellanic Cloud. So this is some maps that people have previously made of the small Magellanic Cloud using variable stars. And what these people did was basically split the cloud up into slices. So the colors of the points here correspond to distance. Um, so they just like made slices and colored in the points according to how far away they were and then made these maps. And eh, yeah, okay. So what we did is we went a bit further. We used the diff distance of each individual star from the mean Levitt law to determine how far away that star is from us. So here the black and what the black points, what the black image behind is um, an optical image of this small Magellanic cloud. And then each of these points is a Cepheid um, color coded by its distance. So you see that this, the stars in this region are like 72 kiloparsecs. And then, oops, did I go the wrong way? Yes. And the stars in this region are around 50 kiloparsecs. So this part is actually much further away than this part, significantly. So what we're doing now is splitting, splitting this up into the different directions. So this way, I'm looking down on the galaxy, and this is spread out away from us. So this, this direction is going away from you, and this is looking down on it. And this is going away from you, and this is looking on the side. So now you can really see what's going on. This galaxy is, might look tiny on the sky, but it's spread out, like, ridiculously far. It's spread, like, this is how it looks on the sky. It's, like, four kiloparsecs, four kiloparsecs. But it's spread out by 20 kiloparsecs. It's five times longer going away from you than it looks So again, I presumed I'd done everything wrong. Um, so the first thing we did is check if it could be reddening. So I, as I said before, even the reddening is dro has dropped dramatically, I didn't want to assume it had gone away. So we still needed to make sure that it couldn't be reddening. So you see, again, like it's color coded, and these points here are where the reddening, that where's, where's the most amount of dust? Now, the maximum reddening here is point, is, is, has a value of 0 0.8. 
Now to account for the 20 kiloparsec stretch, you would need a reddening value of 10. That's what I worked out. Now, that's basically like looking through that wall. So I'm pretty sure that it is not reddening. So this is just to give you a bit of context of what they actually look like on the sky. Um, so here we have the large Magellanic Cloud. You can see it's pretty big. And here you have the small Magellanic Cloud. So it is very small compared to what the large Magellanic Cloud looks like on the sky. Now if we look at, so just notice now that they're flipped around because of their coordinate system. So this is the large one. This is a small one. So we're going to look now at this in 3D. Um, so if we rotate it, now you can really see this is the small Magellanic Cloud is so far elongated. It's actually bigger than the large Magellanic Cloud. <laughs> so um, this is RA and DEC. Um, and then this is distance. This is distance from us. So we're like somewhere down here. <laughs> um, yeah. So we'll just rotate it the other way. And you can see like this is like so far spread out that basically if they were closer together, like and on the sky, they would basically join up. Um and um, yeah, just going back around again. It's kind of ridiculous how how extended this is. Oh, I thought there was one more bit. Okay, so this is the bit I want you to see. Okay, you see this bit here? Looks like it's kind of being pulled pulled off towards there. This is called the Magellanic Bridge. Um, until recently, we thought that was a very old feature. Um, and we weren't sure what it, it was just like due to an interaction, but it was very old. Um, okay, apparently we have to watch it again. Isn't it pretty? I suggested we change the name to the Sausage Magellanic Cloud, and my boss did not let me. <laughs> they made me change the name of the paper. Um, okay, so this is, this is a, pa a paper where they did a simulation of how the clouds would interact. So basically, like, I don't know a lot about theory, but this is some work by Gatina Besler, one of my collaborators. And what she does is she makes models where she has a couple of galaxies and she knows like the orbits that they're on now and she works it backwards to see where they would be and like smashes them together. And she has two models and this one model the SMC basically comes down and smashes through the LMC and leaves this big trail of debris and star formation and awesomeness. So if we look at what we have here and then rotate it to fit, to look like this, we should see, if, if this model is correct, we should see stuff here. And we're starting to see Cepheids like towards here and actually recently, there was a new variable star survey which discovered some seconds here. So, we think now that this model might be true. So, that instead of them just like going near each other and kind of interacting, that actually the SMC just went straight through the middle of the LMC and just got like completely ripped apart. And that's kind of cool. And so this is... This is another example of it happening. So this is like an example of a dwarf that's basically been stripped apart by smashing through another galaxy. So it wouldn't be that rare for it to happen. It's just interesting that it's happened so close to us that we can actually really see what's going on. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> oh, and I just got loads of, loads of money to look at this. Yay. <laughs> Um, so, but, um, what I forgot to tell you at the start is that all of this came about because I was supposed to be measuring the Hubble constant. 
and we got distracted. Um, so the reason we were doing this is because we wanted to recalibrate the, the Hubble constant using the mid-infrared. Um, so one of the, this, this shows you the uncertainty on the Hubble constant from like the year 2000. And they, there was a big project on Hubble, the telescope, to measure the Hubble constant. Um, that was like one of its key projects. And at the end of the project in the year 2000, these were all the uncertainties. So it, uncertainty is a very important thing in astronomy. If you don't know your uncertainties, you don't know anything. Um, so there will be like pages and pages devoted to uncertainties in papers. Um, most of the uncertainty came from the distance to the LMC. We didn't know the distance to the LMC well enough. We, we didn't have any parallax distances to Cepheids in the Milky Way. So we didn't know the distance of the LMC. That was the biggest problem. Um, there was like all this other stuff, but that's like technical things. We also had to use lots of different telescopes. Um, so there was loads of weird stuff going on. So our aim was to try and reduce this. So what we did, by measuring, just by measuring the distance to the LMC better and using Spitzer, we managed to reduce all of that. So we've gone from a 10% uncertainty to a 4% uncertainty. So this was, this was basically our result by just measuring the distance to one galaxy. Now we still have like 20 other galaxies to add into this program that I haven't got around to measuring yet because I got distracted by the SMC. Um, but this, this can only get better at this point. So this is, we're really starting to understand now what the problems were with our technique before and how we can improve it just by understanding where the uncertainties are. So this is basically the, the current state of the art of measuring the Humboldt constant. Um, so this is our result where we measure Cepheids um, in different galaxies and then use the Cepheids to calibrate distances to supernova, which are exploding stars, which are very well calibrated standard candles, and then eventually measure the Hubble constant. So this is our result. Um, this is another result measured by um, Adam Rees, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering that the universe was accelerating, the expansion was accelerating. So we get the same result, so seems good, right? There's actually another way to measure the Hubble constant which is by looking at the cosmic microwave background. Now, instead of that being a standard candle, like Cepheids are, where we know the brightness of something, the cosmic microwave background is what we call a standard ruler, where we know the size of something. So we should get the same answer. So Planck is a, an, the most recent experiment. Um, it's been up the last few years. It's really important. Everyone loves Planck. Planck's result does not agree with our results. Hmm. And WMAP is the, the telescope that was up before Planck, and it doesn't really agree with our results very well either. And in fact, if you look at how we're doing right now, um, we, we, we don't tend to be agreeing with each other anymore. So, yeah, the Hubble constant seems to be going wrong. So there is still lots more to do. Um, but I have some ideas. So we have more things to do with Cepheids. What were those 95% uncertainties, 68% uncertainties? 68. Because if they're just one signal, like 68%, they look like they're consistent to me. Um, there was 68. Um, but like Planck's, Planck is kind of the one everyone trusts right now. And like the, this one is from one galaxy. So this one uses mazes. So mazes are a thing where you can measure the distance to an object in a similar way to parallax. It uses a geometric distance. This only has one object right now. And they're hoping to get a lot more. So the uncertainty on this is definitely gonna drop. Whether it's value will, I don't know. But Planck is the one everyone's worried about. I 
heard them just saying that yours look like they're, you know, two sigma too high compared to Plank. Plank has little tiny rows, so, but yours are not statistically. So, but this was an argument I made for a long time, and I ultimately lost that argument. There have been many papers written about why we should care that it's two sigma. That we're still just graphing at two sigma. Now, I I thought it was okay, but the the trend has been that possibly like it is leaning towards the low end, and and we're tending to be higher. And if you make corrections to ours based on things like supernova mod, new supernova models, ours should be brought down. So I'll I'll talk about that in, in a couple of slides. Um. Yeah, okay, so first the, the first thing we want to do more of with Cepheids is further mapping of the Magellanic Clouds. The reason we want to do this is because it will tell us about the history of the system as a whole um, and because we've just discovered new Cepheids. So rather than just look at a few Cepheids in one cloud, we're going to look at all the Cepheids in both the clouds and the bit in between. So that's actually several thousand Cepheids. So what we're doing is we're going through the archive from Spitzer. So all this data is publicly available. If you wanted it, you could go and get it. Um, and we're going to do the photometry and use light curves. So we know what the light curves should look like. And we're going to use templates to look at all the Cepheids and map out in 3D what the whole system looks like. OK, so now we'll get back to your question. <laughs> um, so where we want to go with the Hubble constant is to get down to 1% precision. Right now, our group is at 4%, and um, Planck is around 2%, um, but we don't understand why. Um, we don't, like the Cepheid groups don't understand the Planck uncertainties, and I, yeah, we don't understand that work. <laughs> so the reasons we would want to get to 1% is, not necessarily for Cepheid reasons. It's for the universe as a whole. If what we can learn from the Hubble constant isn't just how fast the universe is expanding. We can learn about things like dark energy or even how many neutrinos we had. Like, I'm sure you all know that there are three neutrinos. Well, if you look at the latest results from Planck, there are hints that there may be more than three neutrinos depending on the model they use which is weird, right? <laughs> so we need to understand, like, are there more than three neutrinos or is there something different about the model we should be using for the universe? So things like that. Um, the way we want to do this is basically by using multiple distance indicators in the same galaxy. So this is a plot that shows you where the distances that all these distance indicators live. So our Lyrae is another type of variable star. They're similar to Cepheids, very, very similar, but they're much fainter. So we can only really study them in the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds. It's the best places we can do it. So all these galaxies with Cepheids, it's very hard to look at, look at our Lyrae's. But it would be a very good comparison to see if a Cepheid distance to a galaxy was the same as our RLRA distance. Also, supernova. Supernova, one of the main ways we measure the Hubble constant, but there's hardly any galaxies with, with Cepheids in supernova. In fact, there's only eight. We have eight galaxies where we can measure them. And there was some work recently where they found that the, the type of galaxy that a supernova was in made a big difference on its brightness. Who knows why? I don't know why. So, and that actually has, a, has an effect on the value of the Hubble constant that you measure. So, it's, there's all this weird stuff going on that we really don't understand. So, um, yes, we need more. We, we don't understand any of this, basically. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I have no idea what is going on. Um, so, um, I hope I have convinced you that Cepheids are awesome and that we can use 
precision astro pre precision astronomy of, with warm Spitzer to discover to to learn about things like galactic structure to look at the interaction of the the clouds um, to learn about galaxy evolution through the inter um, how the clouds interact how we start new star formation and to look at cosmology and the history of the universe itself. Vicky, stop with time for questions, so we'll go until until five with a first round of questions. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to just get started with a statement that I was very impressed with that three dimensional. You were talking about about getting your paper through and the three D imaging, but uh, to see the small Magellanic cloud become the the larger of the Magellanic clouds by your studies of the three dimensional structure of it was was just fascinating and to have you come in the year of, of your discovery of this with your with your research group, I must say I'm, I'm very excited. I'd like to convey that along to the students. This is really, really exciting work and, and thank you for presenting it. Um, that, I just had that comment. Um, we could start with, with questions then. Yeah. So the, uh... So what they do, so when they take the, the model of the cosmic microwave background, they basically have to fit a universe to it. So to, they're modeling what the universe would have had to have looked like to, to make all this radiation. And you have to put into that things like the number of, neutrino, number of neutrinos, the mass of neutrinos, the amount of matter in the universe, the, um, how much of that is due to baryons, how much of how much, um, how much of the universe is radiation, how much of it is dark matter, and all these various parameters. And the model that they found best fits ha um, has something like 3.4 neutrinos, which is very strange. <laughs> so it's, it's, and that's very interesting to us because the, the model with three neutrinos isn't the best fit anymore. And you, you wanna know, well, is it because there are actually more than three neutrinos, or is there something fundamentally wrong about our understanding of the model? And the, it, it's probably not that there are 3.4 neutrinos. It might just be that there's like another particle that we haven't explained yet in our standard model. It might be like, like I don't know, a weird neutrino-like thing or just something else. And yeah, I think it was 3.4. It was 3. Point something. Something small. <laughs> Oh, so all my observations? Yes. My observations were all taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Sorry, I can't remember what I Oh, that's okay. Yeah, all of mine were done with Spitzer. Yep. Um, can you define the Hubble constant? Can you define it on Oh, the number or what it is? What it is, right? Oh, so the Hubble constant is basically the, the rate that the universe is expanding. So is the, let me get the bigger back up. This is the original figure. So this is the distance to a galaxy, and this is how fast it's moving away from us. So it's the, the relationship between how far away something it is and how fast it's moving away. So it's how fast the universe is expanding. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I had a question on the... Uh... The color, you know, your the cartoon model you showed mm -hmm. showed the, the the denser star um, being blue, and the and the larger star being redder. You know, as we think of in stellar evolution models and yes. the and the light traveling and where the last surface of last get where the light leaves the star. Mm -hmm. um, so why did you find it surprising when, you, when you're presenting a cartoon model that's showing the color of a star changing, then you found when you looked at how bright the star was in your two colors, you saw that, that sinusoidal change, the change in the color of stars. Is there something intriguing about that color change? 
So in the infrared, the, um, the spec when you look at the spectrum of, of stars of different temperatures, they're actually um, completely parallel. They should be completely parallel. Oh, just because you're on that part of the black? Because you're on that part of the spectrum. Oh, okay. So they should be completely parallel. So as you go to different temperatures, it shouldn't change. But what we found is that there's actually what we call an absorption feature um, due to carbon monoxide in the 4.5 micron channel of the camera. Well, it's not in the camera, it's in like the universe. Um, and as the temperature of the star changes, the opacity of that feature changes and like it causes all these weird effects. Um, like we, we're actually just finishing a paper now where we can use that color as a, as a, a measurement of how much metal is in the star. So it's like, that's like another whole hour talk. <laughs> it was like super cool. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We didn't expect it to change color at all because um, what you're basically doing is you're moving. We're, we're looking at a fixed point in that spectrum. So we're, we're not looking at a different, like the star itself might change color, but we're only looking at a specific point on that spectrum with our filter. So even if the, um, the brightness in that filter changes, we're looking at two filters, and if this, the, the star's color is doing this, it's doing that the same amount in both filters. Does that make sense? So when you subtract those two filters from each other, the, the difference is going to be the same, whichever temperature the star is. Whereas if you're in the optical, where it's like doing this, then, yeah. Did that make any sense whatsoever? <laughs> Is there somewhere I can draw it? Yeah, I didn't bring my, no, some of my students have uh, whiteboard pens. Does anyone have a whiteboard pen? All right, we'll, we'll draw it up at the, okay. end, at the end. Okay, right. Right, so if you have a spectrum like this, So these two stars in different temperatures, like th this one minus this one is going to give you a different color. Um, but here, these bits are parallel to each other, so it's not going to cause a color change. Does that make sense? So yeah, like this bit moves like in sync, but this bit is not moving in sync with this part doesn't change by the same amount when you change the temperature. Yes? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's excellent. If we have more questions, let's um, stay around and we'll have a, a continuing more casual question and answer section. But let's uh, thank our speaker again.